Well, good morning, Walden Church. Good morning, Texas. We are currently in the middle of our study in the book of Matthew. We're at Matthew 18, and if you're just joining us, we are trying to read through this entire gospel, get us to Palm Sunday, get us to Good Friday, get us to Easter, and uh, we're doing Matthew because we've already done the other books. We studied Mark, uh, we studied Luke back in 2012, we studied John in 2021, uh, but never Matthew, and so just to make everything line up, uh, we're going to jump around a little bit over the next couple weeks. And to tell the truth, you know, I, I thought the project was probably a little daunting at first because, I mean, Matthew is such a big book, but I have really enjoyed this study and I hope you have too. Uh, Matthew 18, this chapter, is another huge portion of teaching, just solid teaching from Jesus. And we've had uh, a couple of these before. We had the Sermon on the Mount, obviously. Uh, we had all the teaching when Jesus commissioned the disciples, gave them instructions. And then we had two chapters of parables. And so this is the fourth block in Matthew of just a big portion of teaching. And in this chapter, Jesus is going to talk about what it means to be a Christian, and more so, um, how we act as a church. And for as many rules as we place on church and how to do church, there's actually very few instructions in the Bible. Uh, the Bible is more of a code of conduct for us as individuals, not, not actual rules about you know, worship services. So this passage we're going to read today is actually the second time the word church is mentioned. The other uh, place was Matthew 16, right? Where Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. And here, uh, Matthew 18, second time. So that becomes very important. Uh, this is how the chapter begins in verse one. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself, like this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. All right, so uh, I think I'm going to rock your world today. <laughs> because I'm going to suggest that a lot of what we've read in Matthew 18, we don't interpret it in light of the question the disciples asked. For instance, this passage is not about children. It's not about kids. Because the conversation begins with a question about greatness. The disciples ask about rank. They say, who is better? And then Jesus pulls a child over to them, and he says, instead of asking who is greater, you should be asking who is more childlike. And the answer Jesus gives is the answer to the question. In other words, Jesus is telling this little mini parable about humility because a child would recognize where they fit in the family. A child would recognize their dependency on their parents. The child is dependent on their parents for living and for comfort. Okay, Jesus says, be like that. Don't, don't ask about who is greatest. Be humble like this child. He says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fast around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. All right, we're still going, right? Who are the little ones? They're the children of God. Jesus is talking about how Christians should care for and receive one another. Who is greatest? Who is greatest, Jesus? You know what? Instead of worrying about that, I want you to selfishly protect one another's holiness. Jesus says, one such child. One such child is what? Such is the subject matter, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about being a Christian. Jesus says, if you receive me, then you receive Christians. If you receive a Christian, you receive me. If you don't receive a Christian, Jesus says, watch out. Jesus is holding a child, and it's this image 
of the Heavenly Father holding you. The protection and the care that Jesus feels toward us is the same as a parent who protects and watches over their child. This week I saw one of those uh, funny lists. It was like 20 things you have to agree to if you're going to date my daughter. I'll, I'm not going to read all the 20, but I'll give you the highlights. Um, one was, a lady's heart is a fragile thing. If you play with hers, I will show you yours. Another was, if you ever find yourself alone with my daughter, don't panic. Just correct the situation immediately. If I ever catch you trying to get alone with my daughter, that would be a time to panic. Here's the last one. It may sound like I'm joking in threatening you harm. And while I might not physically hurt you, if you offend my daughter or violate her honor, when I am addressing the issue with you, you will not be laughing. We can laugh when we read this, but it's not all fun and games, is it? it the, these are funny because there's a certain truth to them, but Jesus makes a similar threat. He is a protective dad, and he says, if you mess with one of my kids, you're going to feel like you were tossed in the ocean with a rock around your neck. We should selfishly protect one another's holiness because we don't want to cause another brother or sister to sin. And we shouldn't be casual about all of this. I mean, the world is already full of sin, right? You know how much of a hard time you have keeping yourself in check, keeping yourself away from sin. So don't go dragging somebody else down that road. You don't know what struggles they're facing. The world is already so materialistic. Don't add to someone else's materialism. The world is already so addictive. Don't feed into somebody else's addiction. We, we need to protect one another. And we protect one another's holiness while at the same time protecting our own. Jesus says, guard your own heart. Verse 7 says, woe to the world for temptation to sin. For it is necessary that temptation come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Notice Jesus is still talking about protecting ourselves. Correct? Jesus, Jesus guards us as a parent. He holds us like we are a child. But Jesus also makes it clear that you are your brother's keeper. We protect the holiness of one another, and we guard our own heart as well. Jesus says, whatever causes you to sin, cut it out. And it's such a visceral image. It's so violent. But again, hear the parental tone in Jesus' voice. He says, don't be casual with sin. In your life, in somebody else's life, guard your heart. Guard the holiness of Christians. Because if you're casual with sin in your own life, you're going to be casual with sin in someone else's life. So we protect one another. We love one another. And so now, as we're going to enter verse 10 and going forward, bear in mind, we are still talking about the same subject. Jesus is still answering the question. He says in verse 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search for one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. This isn't the only place in Scripture where Jesus compares himself to shepherd or us to sheep, is it? John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is the hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. 
just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. This image of sheep and shepherd is still the same image as protective father and child. Same picture. You and I are in the hands of the protector. Nothing can take you out of his hands. Why do we guard our hearts? Why do we fight for our own purity? Why do we fight for the holiness of other Christians? Because this is how the Father loves us. The Father loves us this way, so we should regard one another this way. If they are lost, we go and find them. If someone has skipped church that Sunday, we call them. If they are sick in the hospital, we visit them. If God the Father loves the flock this much, then we should also. So what happens if a brother or sister falls into sin? What happens if they sin against you or they sin against the church? Perhaps a lost sheep is lost due to some error or some sin in their lives. Well, as the one who is trying to help, as the one who loves them, how do you then restore a Christian? Jesus tells us, starting in verse 15, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two or three agree on earth about every, anything they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now, first, you read this, and I know, I know how it sounds, right? It, this isn't a favorite passage of many because it really feels judgmental, right? I mean, What's all this talk about kicking people out of the church and treating them like a tax collector? I, I thought we were supposed to be quick to forgive. I thought we we're supposed to be people who show a little grace and, you know, cut each other some slack. Well, that's true, but as Christians who protect one another's holiness, we should also be above reproach. And like we talked about last week, we should care about what other people think. We are a body of believers, and so as a body, we should be concerned for the health of that body. And if someone in the church was sick, you would encourage them to get well, right? Absolutely. So even though we may not like it, sometimes we have to correct and restore one another, not because we're judgy, but because we love. And it can be a really slippery slope. So Jesus gives you guidelines as to how to do it. And the first thing he says is, do it privately. It's private. This is the hardest one. It is. You were offended, and you noticed, and you go to them. A sheep wanders off. You saw it. You go after it. The passage starts with, if someone sins against you, right? You go to them, and you keep it just between the two of you. Don't talk about them behind their back. Don't go to someone else for their advice. Don't drag a third person into this by saying, you know, I'm really worried about so-and-so. You go to them. And the point here is you're keeping the circle as small as possible. Why? Because we protect each other. We care about one another. You are, you are protecting somebody else's character. You're protecting somebody else's reputation. And this goes right back to the golden rule. How would you want to be treated if this were you? Would you want a dozen or so people talking about you? No. If a person was upset with you, or if you had wronged someone by accident, you would want them to come to you directly. And most people who are approached at this stage, I would say 90% of them would be repentant. In most cases, I guarantee you, your friend will apologize and the two of you will be friends again and nobody else will have needed to get involved. And look, I know you don't like confrontation. I don't like confrontation. And I know you probably think it's easier to ignore it. Trust me, if you keep it between the two of you, 
it'll get resolved. But what if it doesn't? Well, then the Bible says, grab a friend. Grab a friend. Jesus says, go and get one or two more to go along with you. This happened to me at a church once that I volunteered for. Uh, they skipped step one with me, and they went straight to step two. And it was deeply humiliating. It's embarrassing to be confronted like that. It changes behavior immediately, it does. But what happens is it ends up being a little embarrassing. That's why Jesus says, do step one first. Probably by now, they'll, they'll change their course of action. But what if they don't? Jesus gives you a step three. Tell it to the church. This is when you get the pastor involved. This is when you get the church board involved. And, I, and you might think, well, this sounds really unloving, but it's not, it's not as embarrassing as you might think, because think about this. This is a Christian who has so far shunned the counsel of a friend, shunned a second counsel from a group of friends. But now, because people are so passionate about restoring this person, because this person is so loved and their reputation is so important, rather than ignore it, the entire congregation now gets involved in an intervention in love. This lost sheep is missed and loved so much that an entire army of shepherds is sent by God to restore them. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. So what happens if after all of that, this sheep wants to remain lost? You call them back, they don't want to come back. Jesus says you leave them there. Right? You leave them there. You ask them to leave. This is the command from Jesus, by the way. Just remember that if that sounds harsh, it's because it is. But why would you kick somebody out of the church? Why would you do that? Well, in truth, they've kind of already kicked themselves out, right? I mean, if you really follow the steps that Jesus asks you to take, then it's pretty obvious to everyone this person doesn't really want to belong in the first place. And notice that not only does Jesus say, kick them out, but he says, when you do it, you do it with my authority. That's what the rest of the passage says. That's what he's talking about. That's what this passage means. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. That's what this passage is about. Jesus gives you instruction for church discipline, and he says, and if you follow it, you do it with my authority. Who are the two of you who agree on earth? Who are those? Who are the two or three that agree? They are the ones who confronted the sinner, right? In other words, it's not just now one person's opinion. Jesus says, if, if, y'all, if y'all are good making that call, then I'm good. Jesus says, if the church agrees and you bind something on earth, then you have my support. Do you, do you see this? Don't these passages make more sense when you read the Bible together as a, as a solid chapter? You read the verses together, it makes more sense when you read it in context, right? It's when you lift verses out of context and you make it say what you want it to say. That's when the Bible feels confusing. It's better to read and study large blocks at the same time. So Peter hears all of this, he takes it all in, and then he says... Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? See, we're still talking about the same subject matter, okay? We're not talking about, oh, we're two or three gather, there I am. Oh, you know, oh, well, there's two or three of us, so I guess Jesus is here. No, he's talking about authority. He's still talking about sin. He's still talking about restoring someone. Peter says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. In other words, a sheep runs away, I go to them, they say they're sorry, and then I forgive them, but then they do it again. Then what? So Jesus tells a parable. And we're talking about the same thing, right? Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king 
who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all he had and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him his debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay his debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he could pay his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That sounds pretty self-explanatory, right? And notice when you read this chapter, it doesn't end with the previous teaching. It doesn't end with Jesus saying, kick unbelievers out of the church, the end. That's not how this chapter ends. It doesn't end on a low note. It doesn't end on a sad note. The chapter ends with never stop forgiving one another. Peter is always going to say what's on his mind, right? And if we're honest with ourselves, the question that Peter asks Jesus is a question that we have all wrestled with. Where's the line? You know, how, how do you hold the line here? I mean, what, when is enough enough? And we all know that the more someone is hurt or the deeper someone is hurt, then the harder it becomes to forgive them. And we wonder at what point do we say, I, I don't want to be a doormat anymore and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop being walked on and I'm going to stop forgiving. And Peter was being very generous with his suggestion that you would forgive someone seven times. The religious leaders of Peter's day would have told you three times. That's the max. You forgive them three times and then after that, forget it. So interestingly, long before baseball was ever invented, they already had a three strikes you're out policy. Peter knows that Jesus sees things a little differently. He shows a little bit more grace, a little bit more forgiveness. So Jesus uh, listens to Peter double it, right? Peter doubles three and then he adds one for good measure. So he says seven. Seven times ought to be enough. But the truth is most people have a tough time forgiving someone once. Why is forgiveness so hard? Maybe because we get hurt and then when we get hurt, we want to make other people hurt. So we seek revenge or we seek justice. We want the one who has hurt us to feel the same pain, that same gut wrenching sorrow and that turmoil that they brought into our life. So this is why Jesus tells the parable because he knows that forgiveness is hard. On the one hand, you got a guy who owes 10,000 talents which is the equivalent of millions of millions of dollars. The amount of money that Jesus suggests, it's so staggering, it would have blown the minds of everybody listening to this story. The king wants to collect on this debt and he has a right to, but the man can't pay. And what would typically happen then is you would sell everything this man owned into slavery to recoup the debt. And that means you'd sell the man, his wife, his kids, all his property. But here's the truth, that's us. Right? We stand in this place. We are the first servant. We are the debtors who have incurred a debt with our master that is too great for us to pay. In the pages of the Bible, the language of sin is the language of debt. Just like this first servant, we owe God an amount that we could never pay. It is beyond our grasp. Every careless thought, every word, every deed adds to that debt, and God's justice demands that sin be atoned for, that debt be paid in full. That's why we have the cross. That's where this entire story is going, to the sin that is paid for, 
Jesus pays a debt. He cancels the debt. He cancels the debt that is too large for us to pay. And Jesus doesn't hold that debt against us. It's satisfied. It's wiped clean. It's removed from the record. That's God's grace. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We receive mercy instead of justice. And for this act, we then ought to be gracious, thankful. The heart of this parable and the message that Jesus wants Peter to hear and for, and for us to learn is that God has forgiven us many times over. So we should be the same in dealing with others. What if God only forgave you three times and you were out? What if God only forgave you seven times? So how can we, who've received mercy and have been forgiven a debt that is beyond our measure, how can we then turn and refuse to forgive someone else? Ephesians 4 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. One of the evidences of being a Christian that you put on, the wor on, on display for the world to see is how you treat people around you. So again, we treat others the way God treats us. So real quick, let's go over what that looks like. What does forgiveness look like? What does forgiveness look like and what doesn't it look like? First, forgiveness is not optional. It's not optional, which means forgiveness is a command, right? This is a command from Jesus. Christians don't hold grudges, ever. That means we don't give the silent treatment. We don't try to keep distance from ourselves and others. Instead, we forgive and we forgive and we forgive and we forgive without end. Our first priority is to restore the relationship. Our first party is to go and find that lost sheep. Our first responsibility is to seek and to save the lost. Our first responsibility is to restore the relationship. We protect one another. We watch out for one another. We love one another, right? What's the second one? Forgiveness is not dependent on the other person asking for it. We can't say, well, I'm just waiting for them to make the first move. They know what they did. Wrong. You are the child of God and the world is watching. We love because he first loved us. Shepherds who love do not wait for lost sheep to wander back. Ain't gonna happen. If the relationship is broken, pursue it. Do what it takes to fix it. No shepherd wakes up and says, oh, another one got out. I'm too tired. I've done this too much. I do this every day. I'm done. That sheep can wander back by himself. I'm done. Nope. Jesus says, you never stop forgiving. Ever. Last week we said, you know, you don't always do things just because it's your right. It's my right to do this. Okay. Sometimes though, you relinquish your rights and you take the high road. You take the moral road. You take the right road because it's the right thing to do. That's what we are called to do. Also, forgiveness is not always for the other person. Sometimes we need to do it for our own sake. We have to do it for our own health. In other words, forgiveness is for you. Because if you don't forgive, it rots and festers in you. So we forgive to let it go. So we can move on. We do it for our own mental health. The one who refuses to forgive is keeping a record of wrong and revisiting it over and over again. And if you revisit the hurt, if you relive the hurt, then you are never releasing that pain. Bitterness begins to grow within you and it colors your perception of everything else in life. That's why those people with unforgiving spirits are some of the most unhappy people to be around. Do it for yourself. Do it for your own well-being. 
Also, forgiving is not saying that sin is okay. That's not what you're saying. You're not saying sin is okay. In other words, forgiveness is not validation. You can forgive someone, but at the same time encourage they change their behavior. Jesus forgave the woman caught in adultery. But then, after he did that, he said, change your attitude. Go, he says, and sin no more. Also, forgiveness is not magic. Just because you forgive someone doesn't mean it will restore the relationship. Everything will be perfect. There's a long road sometimes to restoring a relationship, getting it back to where it should be. But even though forgiveness doesn't fix something, it certainly is the beginning of fixing things. And forgiveness is hard. It is. Forgiveness is hard. And the right thing to do typically is. So turn it over to God. Release it to him. Along with your desire for justice, along with your desire for payback, along with your desire for revenge, give it to God. Those things belong to God anyway. The day will come when everything is laid bare before God. So as long as it's today, you do what you can do. You refuse to be hurt. You refuse to be a prisoner to unforgiveness. Allow God to begin the healing process in your life. Remember, in this chapter, when asked who was the greatest, right? Jesus answered back that we should adopt a childlike dependence and a childlike humility. That instead of fighting for the prize of who the greatest is, Rather, we should pursue the greatness in others. And if we're to walk humbly before the Lord, then we should walk in obedience to these words. This is his teaching. He has given it to us. Consider the ultimate example of Jesus. He hung on a cross for our sins. He cried out to God for the forgiveness of the people that nailed him there right? He treated others with forgiveness. So I'll just ask you, whoever you're thinking about right now, whatever face or name popped up, pray for that one who has injured you, that they would be brought to repentance and reconciliation, both between God and you, and pray that the Holy Spirit would use your humility, and your brokenness to draw them back. Draw them to God, draw them to you. The goal is to restore the relationship, right? No more lost sheep. Jesus teaches in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. That's us, peacemakers. Jesus teaches in the Lord's Prayer, Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven others. This morning, I ask you to consider any unforgiveness, any hurts in your life that are challenging you and to let those go. Release those grudges. Release that unforgiving spirit that might hold you captive. Let go of any bitterness and turn all of that pain over to God and instead pursue humility. Pursue lost sheep and ask God that he might bring healing and wholeness and newness of life. Let's pray. Lord, forgiveness is hard, but we know as Christians it is what you've asked us to do. Your son never held a grudge. Your son never gave someone the silent treatment. Your son never cut anyone out of his life. Your son boldly pursued everyone around him. Gentiles, sinners, the outcasts, even the smallest child, Jesus drew near. He was welcoming, he was encouraging, and he did the right thing, even at the cost of his own rights. And he never gave up. Your Bible says that even when he was tired, he didn't take a day off. 
He was interested in touching and healing and teaching and restoring. Lord, may that be our mission and may we pursue it with passion. Lord, if there is any broken relationship in my life, may I make the steps to reconcile, to love, that when I am in the presence of that person, I would go above and beyond to show them that having a relationship with them was more important than any wrong I have felt. That I would approach them first and beg their forgiveness, regardless of my rights, because the relationship was more important. This is the time we have here on earth to chase after lost sheep and to restore them. Lord, may each one be a shepherd. May each one govern and watch over their flock to protect those that you have put in our care and to boldly pursue and to boldly forgive each one because you boldly pursue me. You forgive me each day, each infraction, each thought, each deed. You have paid my debt. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hey, we are, uh, we're here every Sunday and the world is opening back up and things are slowly going back to normal and part of normal for us is you. You are our normal. We would love to have you here with us in our worship services. Uh, we've got two available for you every Sunday. One at 9.30. It's a traditional service. We have a choir and we sing all of your favorite hymns. Uh, we have coffee and donuts in between. So we'd love to have you join us for that as well. And then at 11 o'clock, we have our contemporary service. We have a worship team. And that's also the same hour we have a children's program. We have Sunday school for all ages, uh, from kindergarten all through high school. We even have a youth group that meets every single Wednesday. So regardless of whether uh, you attend our church or not, your children are more than welcome to come to youth group. It's uh, fifth grade through high school, and we'll even feed them dinner. Send them over at six o'clock, and we will feed them and send them home to you in about an hour and a half. We're so close, your kids could walk or ride their skateboard or ride their bike, right? So we'd love to have them, and we'd love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.